I'm going to demonstrate the process of starting up the ARIA 2 from a complete fluidic shutdown state. We typically shut the fluidics down completely and run ethanol through the lines uh, on Fridays. And so this would be a demonstration of, for example, if you're coming in on the weekend and need to use the cell sorter. The process applies for both the ARIA 2 and ARIA 3 in the SCIF. Uh, first thing to know is that we have a detailed startup um, SOP that can be found uh, next to the air valve. And so we're just going to go through this startup SOP uh, step by step. The first step in the startup section is to empty the waste tank if it's full. So typically come over to the waste tank and lift it to see approximately how full it is. If it's greater than approximately halfway full, I would recommend emptying it. To empty it, unscrew the probe and remove it from the tank. And I would set this probe in a waste beaker uh, and take the tank and dump it in the sink across the hall. After you've dumped it, <clears throat> fill with concentrated bleach to the first line on the tank. This is approximately one liter of bleach such that when this tank is, waste tank is full, you'll be at 10% bleach final. And then return, put the probe back in, screw it back in, and place it back on the cart. The next step is to check the sheath tank. Again, I would come lift the tank to approximately feel how full it is. You can also rely on the sensor in the software to tell you how full it is. If you need to refill the sheath tank, you need to depressurize the tank first by pulling up on this ring to completely release any pressure in the tank. Unscrew the, unscrew the lid and press down firmly to get the lid to open. Then you can find additional 1x PBS, which is the sheath fluid we use, in the corner uh, of the desk table uh, next to the ARIA 2. The 10 liter carboys are full, uh, full of autoclaved sterile 1x PBS. And you would simply completely remove the cap and pour in uh, to the upper weld line on the sheath tank. Don't overfill it beyond that upper weld line. Once you've filled the tank, you'll want to reposition the lid and screw it till it's a finger tight. You don't want to over tighten at this point. Um, later you'll ensure that the sheath tank is totally sealed and holding air. The next step is we're going to turn the computer on and allow windows to fully load. You're going to log into Windows using the admin account and the password found on the keyboard. The next step is to activate the compressed air line by coming to the compressed air line and turning the knob counterclockwise approximately five turns until it's fully open. You should see the pressure reading at least 80 PSI. Next, you're going to come over to the side of the cytometer and press the power button. You want to make sure on the ARIA 2 that all four laser, or three lasers are activated by the light being on when you press the power button. After you've turned the cytometer on, come back to the computer and open the fax, BD Fax Diva software. In Diva, you're going to log into your specific account. For today, I'm going to log into the administrator account. Once the software is loading, <clears throat> you should see the uh, instrument trying to connect through the software. In the bottom right hand corner, you should see a yellow light and the word connecting with three dots after it. Uh, if the cytometer is disconnected and it is not connecting, uh, scroll over the um, network icon in the taskbar 
and make sure that there are two networks listed there. There should be an internet network and also an unidentified network. Uh, the unidentified network is the cytometer. If you don't see that network, there may be a connection issue and I would recommend trying to recycle, power cycle the cytometer. Once the cytometer is connected, we're going to run the fluidic startup command. We're going to go to cytometer and click fluidic startup. A window will pop up that will prompt you on how to complete this process. The first step is you have to ensure that the air and fluid lines are disconnected from the ethanol tank and connected to the sheath tank. So we can see down here at the fluidics part that the fluid line is connected to the ethanol tank, the blue line, and the air line is also connected to the ethanol tank. So the first step is we have to remove the air line and connect it to the sheath tank. Next we want to remove the fluid line and connect it to the sheath tank. On the screen now I'm going to press OK and now I'm going to ensure that the closed loop nozzle is in the flow cell. So you have to come over here and make sure that the nozzle that's in the flow cell is the one with the tubing coming out of it. So we won't actually make a stream in the, in the uh, sort block, but instead the fluid is just going to come bypa be bypassed through this tubing. So if I'm sure that's in place, I can press OK. And now you're going to hear a series of uh, valves uh, opening and closing as the cytometer is testing that everything is working uh, for startup. After approximately two minutes of valves opening and closing, you're going to hear it start to pressurize the sheath tank. Initially, I could hear an air was leaking. And if you hear air leaking, you'll want to come and tighten this knob to make a good seal uh, in the lid of the sheath tank. If you tighten it down pretty good, you should hear the hissing stop, and you'll now be able to tell that there's pressure in the tank by lightly pulling up on the ring and just make sure it's able to build pressure. If it doesn't build pressure at this point, the fluidic startup will fail. You can follow the process, progress of the fluidic startup in the window that's popped up. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. The next step will be to remove the closed loop nozzle from the flow cell assembly and to insert the correct nozzle size. Our nozzles, uh, like this 70 micron nozzle, are stored in a tube with sterile DI water, approximately a half mil, and we store them in the drawer uh, under the LSR2 cytometer. So I'll go ahead and remove the closed loop nozzle by turning this knob, which will free the, the closed loop nozzle, and you can just slide it straight out. Every time you remove a nozzle, you want to make sure that the red o-ring is still in place. If the o-ring ever comes out, it'll be stuck in the instrument and it'll need to be removed. These nozzles are glued in place, so they shouldn't uh, come out, but it does happen occasionally. You can place the closed loop nozzle in this little holder, and now uh, take your nozzle you'll be inserting, and I usually just slide it out into some chem wipes and dab off any um, water, being very careful not to actually touch, uh, not to actually touch the o-ring, but just to dab off any excess water around the nozzle. And then take the nozzle, make sure it's o-ring side up, and you're going to just push it in firmly until you feel it hit the back wall of the flow cell and you can't push it any farther. It doesn't take any force really. And then you're going to turn the black knob to lock, lock it into place. And now your nozzle is properly inserted. So I can go ahead and hit OK or done to both of these. And now the fluidic startup is complete. 
And the next step is we need to make sure that our configuration of our cytometer matches the nozzle that we have in. So we're going to go to the cytometer uh, tab and click on view configurations. You have to make sure that you have the correct, uh, the correct nozzle configuration and pressure uh, selected. So we have three different configurations, but this is our standard uh, 70 micron configuration. So you want to select that and press set configuration. It'll ask you if all the mirrors are in the proper places and you just hit OK and then press OK again. And now it brings you to this screen that you can now just close out of. And your software should read at the top the, the proper nozzle size and configuration. And also in the uh, stream window, you should see that it has the appropriate nozzle size here, 70 micron. This is really important or your stream will not look proper. Now we're ready to turn on the stream. You can turn on the stream by pressing the red X button in the stream window and you're going to hear the stream starting. And you should see a solid stream initially and then as the pressure changes you should see it break up into drops. You can visually inspect the stream by coming over and opening this door, looking inside and making sure that the stream is going into the center of the waste compartment. If it's going off to one side or the other, there is there are two adjustment screws uh, that you can alter. You can scoot this whole apparatus side to side. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, because most likely it's due to a partial clog in the nozzle. Uh, these, these nozzles should be set up to be, uh, for the stream to be going right in the center of the waste drawer. You'll want to allow uh, at least five minutes for the stream to stabilize. You're going to see some minor fluctuations in the stream. Um, with the Aria 3, it actually takes about 30 minutes to, for the stream to stabilize. With this instrument, it usually only takes about five minutes for the stream to get stable. But what you want to see is that your drop one value is, is fairly constant. Um, and once that looks like it's not moving anymore, now you can adjust the amplitude uh, to get the drop one value where you want it. So we don't typically adjust the frequency. Um, frequency we, we leave constant. But we want to adjust this uh, amplitude to get our drop one to approximately 274, which were, was the prior setting of this instrument. And it's currently at 332, so if I increase my amplitude, I'm going to get my drop to move. So now it's at about 272, which is pretty close to 274. And I can increase it to get my gap size to increase, or decrease it to get my gap to decrease. I want my gap to be at 6 uh, for the 70 micron nozzle. So once I have settings that are fairly consistent, with a gap of 6 and a drop 1 value uh, where I want it, approximately 272. I can now turn the sweet spot on and that will keep the stream uh, where it is. It will auto adjust the amplitude to keep the, stream, um, to keep the stream stable. The next step is to run uh, the CSTB calibration beads through the instrument. So these beads can be found in the mini fridge. They have a black cap. Um, and what we do is we take approximately uh, a half mil of, flu of PBS or water filtered um, in a tube and add two drops of the CST beads that have been vortexed. It's really important to vortex them to mix them prior to, uh, prior to getting them out of the bottle. And then after you've dropped them, again vortex them. To run CST, you're first going to have to turn off the sweet spot because CST can't run with the sweet spot on. And then you're going to come to cytometer and click on CST. And that's going to bring up a new window that's going to allow you to run CST. First and foremost, you have to select the right uh, bead lot ID. So check your black capped uh, tube to ensure that the bead lot is the same in the software as what's on that tube. Then you're going to have to wait for it to connect. 
once it's connected, now you can press the run button. But before we press run, we're going to have to ensure that the, first of all, that the hood is down. So you have to close this hood. Uh, this will activate the lasers. If the hood is open, uh, the lasers won't, won't hit the flow cell, and you can't actually visualize your sample. And you're going to place the CST beads on the loading port, and then come back to the software and press run. Uh, it's going to prompt you to make sure you have the correct lot ID and you press OK. And now it's going to load the, B, the tube uh, into the cytometer. Now on the screen you're going to see some plots and you want to make sure that after about five seconds you should start to see some events showing up. Uh, the CST is an automated program so uh, it should, should run fully automatically. If you have any issues with CST, uh, try re remaking the beads and running it again. The CST process typically takes about 10 minutes to run. When the process is finished, it'll unload your tube. And you'll see on the screen to unload the beads. And it'll then tell you whether or not CST calibration passed, and you can view the report. What you're really looking for are your CV values should be under 6% for the bright beads, and your PMT voltages in this delta PMT V column are not uh, different than about 50 from the, from the baseline value. If you see an error or warnings or a failure on CST, you can always contact the core staff, uh, or if the warning is for a high CV, uh, if it's slightly over 6%, which does occasionally happen, that's still okay. You can still run your experiment. So now you would close out of this window, and it'll bring you back to this screen. And you can, it's going to reconnect. And now you'd want to turn the sweet spot back on. And the next step is to set your drop delay. To set the drop delay, we're going to use a bead that's called an AccuDrop bead. These beads can be found in the mini fridge. They have a blue cap. And you want to uh, drop approximately one drop per one mil of water or one X PBS. There are a couple ways to set the drop delay. I prefer to do it manually. And I'll show you from scratch uh, how to do this process manually. First thing you'll want to do is create a new experiment. Uh, I usually have a template, but I'll just create a new one to demonstrate. And I'll call it 70 micron AccuDrop. Within that experiment, we'll create a new specimen. And within that specimen, we now have tube 1. Go ahead and load your AccuDrop beads. We'll start at a flow rate of 2 and load the tube onto the cytometer. While that's loading, let's make a forward and side scatter plot. And within that forward and side scatter plot, I'm going to make a gate in the bottom right portion. As the beads are coming up, I'm going to adjust my parameters so that the uh, beads are on scale. Because right now, they're um, likely too high on both the forward and side scatter. Okay, so there I can see my beads are now roughly in the middle of the screen, and I've got a P1 gate down here. I can right-click on that P1 gate and select Invert Gate. That will bring up um, an inverse gate, and if I press Control g to bring up my populations, I can see I have a gate called P1 and a gate called Not P1. Now I'll want to make a new sort layout. So I have to stop acquiring the beads and go up to Sort, and select new sort layout. In this sort layout, I'm going to select for my precision mode. For device, I'll select two tube. For precision mode, I'm going to select fine tune. And to the left, I'm going to have it sort not P1. So effectively, what I'm doing here is instructing the instrument to sort everything that's outside of the P1 gate, which should be everything. And so what I want to see is that all the drops are getting deflected uh, to the left. So I'm going to go ahead and start acquiring the data again. And I'm going to press, once the data starts coming up, I'm going to press the sort button. 
Now it's going to prompt me, do I want to move the, the waste drawer into the sort position or into the waste position? If I press cancel, it's going to leave it in the waste position. That's what I want to do at this time. When you do that, you have to manually turn on the voltage to the deflection plate. So I'm going to press the voltage button here. And now I should see in this window down here, my mainstream and a side stream coming off that should contain the beads. But to know if it contains the beads or not, what I have to do is put the optical filter on. So the optical filter only is going to allow me to see red light, which the beads fluoresce red. So when I turn on the optical filter, now I can see that pretty much everything is getting deflected to the left. That's exactly what I want. Um, we just got lucky because this instrument had been set up recently with the same nozzle. So I'm going to demonstrate what it would look like if it were off. So this drop delay value is what you're setting. And this is a time value from when the, uh, the cell of interest goes is detected by the instrument to the point where it's in the break off, breaking off droplet. So if this time delay is off, let me just affect it like that, you can see that all the beads are going into the waste, and none are going to the left. So what I have to do, what my task is, is to get this to as close to 100% as possible. And we usually say roughly, you know, greater than 96, 97% is acceptable. Um, with 70 micron nozzle, you want this to be running near about 3,000 events per second, so you get to, s so you can see a good population. So I'm gonna turn my flow rate up to about four to get my event rate up a little higher. Now let's assume your AccuDrop value is really far off. So I can see that 100% of my events right now are going into the waste and none are getting deflected to the left. This would be like an example of a worst case scenario if you came in and tried to run AccuDrops. The way to adjust this to, to manually do this reasonably quickly is to press down the control key and press on the up and down arrows. So my value currently is 35.47. And I'm going to go up by whole integers by pressing down the control key and, and pressing the arrow. So now I've gone to 36.47, and I can see I'm still at none getting deflected. 37.47, still none getting deflected. 38.47, 39.47, still none getting deflected. 40.47. Okay, at 40.47, I can see that I've got about 90% of the cells getting deflected. So from there, I want to fine tune it. Um, so I'm going to now just press the up or down arrow to move by increments of 0 0.03 on the drop delay value. So I'm going to try going up a couple times. And usually you want to let this stabilize before you, um, don't, you don't want to move too quickly. Okay, I can see it's improved. It's now about 94 by 95%. So I'm going to keep going up seems to be the right direction. Now I've gone to 40.65 and I can see I've got about 96, 97 percent. I'm going to keep going up a little more. Okay, now it's reading at 40.71, it's reading about 98 and now it's telling me about 100. So right now it's it's about as good as it's going to get. 99.5 um, percent. Looks like it's averaging greater than 99 percent. So I'm going to say that that's an extremely good AccuDrop uh, delay value at 40.71 and at this point I can stop the sort, stop acquiring and unload the tube and it's going to ask me if I want to save the report and I'm just going to cancel out of that. Now that our drop delay value is set, the next thing we want to do is set our side stream trajectories. So first thing you need to know is what, what kind of a sort are you doing? Are you doing a four-way sort? Are you doing a two-way sort? Are you doing a plate sort? Um, all those things are going to uh, affect what type of sort collection device you use and how you set your side stream trajectories. I'm going to assume we're doing a four-way uh, sort today. And so the first step is I want to have all my sliders turned on. Um, the outer sliders I usually put close to 100%. Um, the inner sliders usually are anywhere around 40% when we do a four-way uh, sort. And so I'm going to turn the voltage on and press the test sort button. What this test sort button does is it brings out the side streams as if it were sorting. So you can see four side streams appear, and they all look really nice and tight. 
Uh, this is going to be first a function of the gap value, which we have set to 6. So our, that looks really nice. If, if our gap were up maybe closer to 11 or 12, uh, we would start to see extreme fanning of these side streams. Um, the other thing that affects this is these values for second drop, third drop, and fourth drop, and the phase setting. So I wouldn't change any of these unless you are seeing, um, like, for example, usually the center stream can fan out, um, which is not ideal. You want this to be as tight as possible. And if you're getting that with a good gap value, you may not want to adjust the second drop, third drop, and fourth drop values to try and get these side streams as tight as possible. Once it looks pretty good on the screen, you'll want to stop your test sort and turn your voltage off. And now I'm going to lift up the hood, and what we're going to try and do now is visually determine if the side streams are going into the tubes. And this is really important because you don't want the case where you're missing your tube, even if it looks good on the screen. So what I would do is put four uh, dummy tubes into the uh, collect tube collection holder, and we can install this. Um, we'll leave the door open, and I'm going to move the waste drawer into the uh, sort position by clicking by clicking on this icon that says waste drawer, and you'll hear a click. And now your waste drawer has been retracted. So now when I sort, those side streams are going to go in the tubes. And now if I turn the voltage on again and press test sort, I can now see the side streams coming out. And this may not be visible on video. But what I'm going to do is look from above. I'm going to see my four streams. And what I want to do is move those sliders in and out to where the stream is going perfectly into into the four tubes. And so I can see I need some slight adjustment coming in on the right side. So I'm going to pull my right sliders in just a little bit, the near right and the far right. OK, and now it looks like they're all going right into the middle of the tubes. So now that my side stream trajectories are set, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off the voltage. And now the red light's gone off, and now I can safely close this door. And now that my side streams are set, I'm going to, last thing I want to do to make sure this is all sterile inside, is I may spray down with some ethanol. So typically I'll take some 70% ethanol and I'll squirt it on a Q-tip. And I'll wipe down on the inside of this, um, sort block just to make sure the the deflection plates uh, also making sure the deflection plates don't have any salt buildups on them, on them. Uh, I can also take a, a Kim wipe that's sprayed down with ethanol and wipe the inside of the door for example and it's a good idea to wipe the inside of the bulk injection chamber with some 70% ethanol just to make sure all your surfaces are sterile. And I'll spray the, um, the tube collection area as well. I'll take the dummy tubes out and also spray and wipe the uh, collection device. So at this point, we can close the door, we can lower the hood, the hood has to be lowered in order to see any events. Now we can come back to the software and we can run a tube of 10% bleach. So I'll just go ahead and put the bleach on the loading port, and I'll open any old experiment and load the tube. And I'm going to allow 10% bleach to run for about five minutes to ensure that the sample line is sterile. 
Next, I'm going to load a tube of uh, filter sterilized DI water for approximately two to three minutes just to um, purge the line, the sample line, of any residual bleach that could affect the viability of your cells. And once you're done running water, you've finished your setup. You've run um, CST beads, you've set up the stream, uh, you've set up the drop delay and the side stream trajectories, and you've sterilized the sample line. Uh, so now you're ready to create your experiment and run your sort.